easiest to use this property of, of square roots. So we've got the square root divided by the square root and the square root of the fraction that you're seeing, 70, 20, whatever, those numbers next to each other, 1,960. And then we simplify that fraction as much as possible. Uh, looking for how, how do we, this is not a uh, uh, trivial thing to say. How are we simplifying this fraction? What are we looking for? Common factors. Common factors. What's a factor? Remember, is it what? Yes, that is the perfect definition of a factor. It's better than, it's a number that goes into that number that's really nebulous and arbitrary. It's a number that you can multiply by another number to get this larger number, okay? So can we find any common factors? Maybe not the largest common factor right off the bat, but whittle it down a little bit. 60? That was... Seventy-two, sixty, and thirty-nine, sixty divided by sixty each gives us one twenty-one over sixty-six. That's fantastic. Do those two share any factors? Eleven. Okay, this divided by eleven is eleven, and this divided by eleven is six. And that's it. Okay, so simplify the fraction as much as possible. <coughs> so you get the square root of 11 over the square root of 6. Well, that was easy enough. That's just simplifying a fraction. That's the thing new. The thing that's new about simplifying a fraction with square roots in it is let's just chalk it up to an age old math tradition. We don't have square roots in denominators. Not because they're wrong, but because we just, we just won't have it. Okay. <coughs> so does anybody remember how we? Rectify that situation, Amy? Uh, you take the times uh, root 6 over root 6. Times root 6 over root 6. The reason we choose root 6 is because root 6 is a denominator. If we multiply root 6 by root 6, what's root 6 times root 6? Um, 6 and 6. The square root of 6 is a number that when you multiply it by itself, you get what? 6. And what are we doing? We're taking the square root of 6, a number that if you multiply it by itself, gives you 6. Taking that number, multiplying it by itself, so we should get 6. And what do we get in the numerator? Square root of 66. Next question, Abby. 24 and 27. 24 and 27. I don't know if we're going to let you do that. Two at once, like that. Kind of cheating. Okay. Solve by using square roots. Okay. Just let me know when you're done talking. You know, you know we can go over this test. Um, right. so solve using square roots is great. It's a great opportunity. To not take very long to solve an equation. You just get to take the square root of both sides rather than having a factor or a complete square or all that stuff. Or completing the square would be the same thing. We're trying to have new square roots. But it's already just prepared for us on a silver platter to take the square root. We just need to get the square thing by itself so we can take the square root and cancel out the square. How are we going to get the square thing by itself? Negative four. Negative four. Negative four. Negative four. Negative 24 divided by negative 4 is a positive 6. Pay dirt right here. Take the square root 
of both sides. Now x plus 9 equals what? Plus or minus the square root of 6. I'm so close to having x by itself. Subtract that. You can write plus or minus the square root of 6 minus 9. It just looks confusing when you write things after the square root symbol. Sometimes it's nice to put a little damn thing like that. That's, that's the end of the, of the radical. So using square roots, get that, you, the, the whole idea is that you can cancel out a square with a square root. So the only thing you need to do before you do that is to get the square thing by itself. Get that square thing by itself, whatever it takes, and then take the square root. And after that, just remember plus or minus, and you probably just have to subtract 9 and add 5 or something like that. Okay? Anybody else want 27? So very similar, just an extra step here. So we want to get the square thing by itself because ultimately we want to use the beautiful, beautiful tool of the square root. So how do we get the square thing by itself? Add 29, 3 times x minus 8 squared equals add 29, 50, 66. All right. Yeah. Never mind the lesson. I was going to add 37. Oh, 37. Yeah. Okay, we're just going to go with 66. Yeah. Divide by 3. Divide by 3. <coughs> Until the very end, all this is is combining my terms. Okay? Uh, so negative 2 plus 4i, there's really no reason for these parentheses, right? So all we have here is a 1 times this. There's not, no exponents. There's, we're not dividing it by anything. It's just negative 2 plus 4i times 1. Okay, but this one needs to the negative distributed, so negative 3 minus 9i. We've got like terms here negative 5. 4i minus 9i is negative 5i. That's it. We got a real number. We got an imaginary number. That's all she wrote. That's all there is. The only thing that we would do more than that if, is if we wound up with an i squared in there. What's i squared equal to? Minus one. How about i to the third? I. Negative i. I to the fourth. Oh. It's just this is negative one. It's positive one. And then it goes, and I to the fifth is I, and it all starts all over again. Okay. The, only, the only thing past this that we can do is if we have an I squared, I to the third, I to the fourth. Anything I to the anything but one. But if you're down to this, this is as simple as it can be. formula. It's written up there for you. You don't have to remember it. There it is. I am going to ask you to derive it, but if you derive it incorrectly, that's okay. You can still use it correctly. It's right there. Alright? So, what is the quadratic 
formula is right over there, so what do we do? Add nine. Why are you adding nine to both sides? Okay, it's very important if you're going to use a quadratic formula that you start out with ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. That's very, very important. If you remember from deriving the quadratic formula, we started out with it equal to zero. Yeah, our a, b, and c are referring to an equation where ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. So we have to start from that place. 3x squared plus x plus 9 equals zero. I'm going to write it like this just to uh, mess with you a little bit. Is this the same as that? Yeah. Yeah? I just transmuted it. We can switch the order. So, how do I know what a is? The one with the square. The one with the x squared. The number, the coefficient, the coefficient is a number that you're multiplying by a variable. So, the coefficient of x squared is a. So, a is 3, b is. 1, because it's the coefficient of x, which is just a 1, and c is 9. Don't let the order mess with your head. So you see the quadratic formula over there? Negative b plus minus, blah, blah, blah. x equals negative b. b is 1. Negative 1. Plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a, which is 3, times c, which is 9 over 2 times a, which is 3. Negative 1 plus or minus the square root of, so we got 1 minus 4 times 3 times 9, uh, 108. 1 minus 108, negative 107, over 6. And how do we write the square root of a negative number? It's an imaginary number. We want to use the imaginary number. I. I times the square root of 107. Because what is I? Square root of negative 1. I is the square root of negative 1. That is the imaginary unit, the basis of the imaginary number system. The only other thing we try to do is maybe simplify the square root of 107. Okay. Let's do something like the square root of, this is a totally unrelated example, okay. only to give you an idea here. So uh, 32. How would we simplify the square root of 32? Four. What's that? Square root of 4 times the square root of 8. The square root of 4 times the square root of 8. Why'd you do that? Because 4 is the perfect square. So do the square root of perfect square, square root of 4 is 2. Can we simplify the square root of 8? Yeah. Square root of 4 times the square root of 2. That's also 2. That's 2 times 2 times the square root of 2. That's 4 root 2. Right? We separate it into factors so that one of the factors is a perfect square. Okay. So can we do that with 107? Mm -hmm. Split it up into factors so that one of the factors is a perfect square. <coughs> you, why are you so sure that you cannot do that? <coughs> How do you know it's prime? You just know when you look at numbers and you know they're prime. Seven. Seven. Is it seven and seven? <laughs> they have a prime field? Yeah. Okay, they do actually have a prime field. Okay. But 27, that's not prime. No, oh, okay. This is a really interesting question. How do we decide whether or not this number 107, or any number that for that matter, is prime? Throw it out there. Some, some part of it. How do you decide if it's prime or not? Okay, it can't be divided by anything but one in itself. So how do we go about showing that it, if it is prime, that it can't be divided by anything else? Asking ourselves, is it divisible by this thing? Is it divisible by this thing? Is it divisible by this thing? Is it divisible by two? No. How do you know? The last number is not an even number. It's like not two, four, six, eight, or zero. Uh, how about three? How did you do that so quickly? Three. 
There's a little trick. Have you ever tried? Nine. Is it nine? Doesn't matter. Well, nine times twelve is three. Huh? That doesn't. Three doesn't go into one, but twenty-one is divisible by three. Yeah. Oh, you add up the numbers and then if it's x, it's divisible by 3. Have you heard that before? No. no. If you add up the digits, 1 plus 7, you get 8 yeah. plus 0. Right? It's eight. Then you say, is 8 divisible by 3? And if it is, the number is divisible by 3. If it's not, then it's not divisible by 3. So 7 plus 1 is 8. 8 is not divisible by 3, so 107 is not divisible by 3. How about 4? No. No, it wasn't divisible by 2. It can't be divisible by 4 or 6 or 8 or 10 or 12 or any other. Wait, so, can you do that with everything or just three? Just three. Oh. You can do it with nine sort of with two digit numbers. The digits of a number that's divisible by nine and it's a two digit number that add up to nine. So like 54 is divisible by nine, five plus four is nine. But it only works up through the two digit numbers. Uh, and it doesn't even work for 99 actually. 99, nine plus nine is divisible, or 99 is divisible by nine, but 99 plus nine is not. Nine. Nine. Yeah. But that's divisible by nine too. That's not really a rule for nine. Okay. Um, okay. So not two, not three, not four. Five? No, it doesn't end five or zero, six? No. No, that was one of those even numbers that can't be divisible by seven? No. It's not really a nice trick for seven. I've read one. I didn't try and learn it because it was more complicated than just dividing it by seven with your calculator. So divide by seven with your calculator, you find out no, no, uh, not eight, no. not nine, because it's not divisible by three, not ten, eleven. No. How do you know? Because I did it. Because you did it. How far do we have to go? Forever. Or, how do you, or you, can just, you can just stop. How do you know you're done? What? How do you know like thirteen doesn't go into one hundred seven, or, or seventeen, or nineteen? Okay, but how do you know when to stop? You stop at 19, how do you know you shouldn't go on to 23? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah? Well, like, if you type in square root of 107 and it doesn't simplify it, then it's fine. Yes? Well, okay, so if you have a calculator that you type in the square root of a number and then it's like you can type in square root of 32 and it does this for you? Yeah. Okay. That's not really a mathematical concept. I that's just a feature of your calculator. It is a nice feature, but it's not really a mathematical idea. And most of the none of the calculators I have do that. So maybe that do. How high do we have to go? The truth that the, the answer, well, the answer for this situation is we can stop at eleven. Once you know that eleven doesn't go into it, you can stop. Now how do you know? I know. How am I so sure? Because three didn't go into it, four didn't go into it. Okay. But who's to say that, okay, so 11 didn't go into it, but how do you know 13 doesn't go into it? I don't know. How do I know 13 doesn't go into it? I know it doesn't. Because of three. So you already know three can't go into it. 13 is not divisible by three. No. Because 11 times 11 is 121, and so anything that's above 11, you would have to multiply it. Okay, so what? So we got to eleven, all the way up to eleven. Eleven times eleven is well, it's it's bigger than. What are you getting at? Not well, eleven times eleven is, but eleven, which is the number eleven, is bigger than. Dude. What's that? <laughs> no, eleven is bigger than what? If eleven times eleven is one twenty-one, yeah. Then eleven is is we did two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We got to eleven. Eleven is past ten. Uh, all of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the square root of? Of 107. Exactly. That's what I said. Was I right? <laughs> I can hear you. Yes. Oh, 
wasn't ignoring you. Can I be my desk and now I can leave? Yeah. Say it really quietly. Let me see your earrings. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> to answer that question, the biggest you have to go, our common thought is that you would have to go up to half of the number, right? Half of 107, and then, but it's actually much smaller than that, it's just past the square root. If you get past the square root of 107, now all you're doing is getting into those bigger numbers that if, if one of the smaller numbers would have been a factor, you're just finding like the one that it would pair up with. Does that make sense? Right? So you get you pass that line where, though, like at the square root, that number times itself, right? Those two numbers are equal to each other. Get you the number like 121. 11 squared is 121. If you go bigger than 11, then pass the square root. The square root is that line. If you want to test to see if a number is prime, just go up to the square root. And if you pass the square root, just stop, because now you've proved that it's prime and nothing has gone. So 107 is not simplifiable. It's not factorable. We can't simplify the square root of 107. OK? Other questions? Always. No. <laughs> no. No graphing questions. That is. Oh, yeah. this, but now we're at the point where we're just going to have to recognize something that's in standard form, something that's in intercept form, or something that's in vertex form. Those are the three forms that we can run into. Okay. We spent a lot of time me showing you why this is the form that it is, and if you, if you don't know why, the time for teaching you why is, is past. Okay. Can anybody recognize which form this is in? That one? That's in vertex form? That's in vertex form. Right. Intercept form is one factor times another, and that's it. Maybe times a, like another number, but it's factor times a factor times a factor times a factor, right? It's just multiplication. This is multiplication of, of this thing times this thing, but also then minus one, so that's not. So it's vertex form. Why is it called vertex form? Where's the vertex? Oh, wait. This is something, something x minus h, k. Uh huh. x minus h plus k. H is the first part, right? Yeah. H is the first part? Yeah. So it's 3. 3. And then 1. Negative 1. Negative 1. There's your vertex. That's really significant to know where the vertex is. That gives you an idea of where that parabola lives, right? If you know that, you know a lot about that parabola. You know that you have this thing. What's this called? That's the line of symmetry. <clears throat> line of symmetry, axis of symmetry. Goes right through the vertex. Now, if you knew that that point was on the parabola, but you didn't know it was the vertex, you'd still be kind of <clears throat> lost. You just kind of have to randomly guess and find points and then see it take shape and, and uh, just kind of guess that it's what it's supposed to look like. But given that this is vertex form, we can find the vertex very easily. Now what do we need in order to draw a parabola once we have the vertex? Some more other points. Any points we want. Any other points you want. So how are we going to find another point? Put in zero. Put in zero for x? OK, why not? So put in zero for x. Zero minus 3 minus 1. That's, uh, sorry, squared. Uh, so that's. Negative 3 squared is 9. Negative 9 minus 1. Negative 10. So we have a point at 0, negative 10. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. At that point. go over 3 the other way. Okay, so this is 3 away from that line of symmetry. So 3 the other way. And we should see a point mirrored over that line of symmetry. And we're done. And then the next. Right? Kind of confirms what we what we suspected from the beginning. It should open down because we have a negative in front of this squared thing, right? When you have a negative in front of the squared thing, whether it's just an x squared 
or an exit inside of parentheses squared, you know it's going to open down. <coughs> This one? No, uh, right. This one. Once we've found this one, the axis of symmetry tells us the parabola is, is symmetrical, so we can just reflect it over that line. Okay. Are we done? No, Dan has a question. Dan has got a question. Abby, Fed, Danica. No. So Abby would have to ask a question. Got it? Danica, you want it. Number one. Because I'm so afraid of asking questions. It's going to be when we do this all class period. <laughs> okay. We're going to graph this. What form is this in? There's only three really to choose from. Standard. Standard. Remember that graphing a parabola, well, graphing any graph is just about finding the solutions to that equation and then plotting those points, seeing a pattern, connecting the dots, right? Uh, now that we've broken down parabolas and know that they have a special point called vertex, maybe they have some x-intercepts, um, and they're symmetrical, that's enough information to, to get us a pretty good looking graph. If we can find that vertex <coughs> somehow, uh, that's a big deal, okay? So if, in, in standard form, is there a way to find the vertex pretty easily? How do we do that? Okay. That's definitely important. What is the significance of having found that number? It's what? She's talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> but let's go ahead and find it. Okay, so negative b, negative 6 over 2 times a, a is 3. So we find negative 6 over 6, negative 1. What is the significance of the number negative 1? X. X of what? The of the vertex. So the vertex has an x value of negative 1. If we have an x value, then we want the y value. Plug in the x value. Okay, 3 times negative 1 squared plus 6 times negative 1 plus 4. That's 3 minus 6 plus 4. That's uh, negative 3 plus 4 is 1. Negative 1, 1 is where the vertex is. Negative 1, 1, 1. Since we know it's the vertex, now we know there's an axis of symmetry that goes right vertically through that vertex. <coughs> What else do we need to graph this parabola? Some other points? Any points you want? Maybe some points that are close to the vertex, because if you get too far away from the vertex, you get really, really far away yeah. vertically. Zero is good, zero is right there. So, and zero is really easy in, in uh, standard form. Zero, it's gone, zero, gone. Four is all that's left, zero comma four. And line of symmetry lets us reflect it over and we've got plenty of info to draw a good look at the graph. How'd you get the 2A? That's something that uh, is one of the rare occasions where I ask you to memorize that. But if you notice, negative B over 2A is just the, this part of the quadratic formula that's no coincidence. Okay? So negative b over 2a is just the non-square root part of the quadratic formula. And this gives us the x value of the vertex. <coughs> the whole thing, not just the 2a, but the whole fraction. All right, anything else? Yeah, we can do that. Uh, uh, uh. You want to throw rocks at Dakota? That's fine. What? That's just fine. What? Throw rocks at Dakota.